How are you? It's a delight to see you. My mom's mom, Mama, Rebecca Stroop, used to attend and host quilting circles. Women from the community would gather in one person's house around the kitchen table. When they arrived, they brought a bag in which they had been saving fabric. They were to make a quilt out of the fabric. The fabric wasn't gathered up at a fabric store of exquisite quality that then would be turned into a quilt and then sold in a New York boutique for $25,000. No, these were pieces of fabric left over from clothes that no longer could be sewn or patched or worn anymore. From a variety of shirts and skirts and dresses and aprons, pillowcases and sheets and jeans that could no longer be patched they had fabric, and the fabric would be cut into different shapes depending upon the pattern the quilt would take, rectangles or squares or interlocking circles or starburst. And the color palette would come from that fabric, and the color palette usually represented the Shenandoah Valley in the month of October. Brilliant greens and yellows, oranges and reds and browns, all woven together to look like something glorious. Uh, when they gathered, the women would sit around the kitchen table and they would always have just enough food and just enough time for sewing and all the gossip you could ever consume in one afternoon. One quilt would be made and all of the women would work on the one quilt, not their individual quilts, but they would contribute their fabric and the pattern. So the person who was going to receive the quilt at the end of the work would have picked the pattern they wanted and the color palette that they wanted, and then the fabrics would be chosen and cut so that they match that pattern. Um, you know how it works. You maybe you have a triangle that's going to go in the pattern, and you uh, put it there and sew it next to other pieces of fabric. And then in the back of it, there is an opening where you put some down or something that will make it warm. Uh, later, they began to put felt that would go, and then there was a backing piece so that all of it was, it was incredibly heavy. I remember when I was about four years old visiting my mama in her house that was made with my grandfather's hands that had no indoor plumbing and the only source of heat was a wood stove used for cooking that was in the kitchen. So in the winter like this, it was freezing cold. And when I would get underneath the quilt of my grandmother, my body couldn't move because it weighed more than I did and I would be in like Flint for the rest of the winter. Um, she made gorgeous quilts. My mom, my mama was the first one in the community to get a telephone. Um, now, the telephone worked as uh, kind of like having an extension. Up, uh, some of you, that won't make any sense, but there was something at one time called an extension. You could have a phone downstairs and a phone upstairs. The, one, the phones used to be wired, they went into the wall. They had wires that connected them to the headset. You couldn't go very far, but you had to stay near the phone. Um, so this, when the, when the telephones first went into Singer's Glen, where my grandmother lived, the phones were all connected on the same line. And so ringtones, like, like, not like the Allman Brothers Band in memory of Elizabeth Reed telling you that Sharon's calling. No, but ringtones, everybody had their own ringtones. So uh, there was a common operator who when their phone call was going to your house would ring you with three rings that were long or three rings that were short, whatever it was that was your identified ring. And then you knew to pick up and everybody else knew the call wasn't for them. But in an era before television or radio, if you wanted to be entertained, the very best thing you could do was listen in, <laughs> quietly on your end to know what was going on. The reason that made perfect sense is because the gossip that happened on the telephone fed what you did at the quilting circle so that you always had some news to share. If you were new to the community, the best thing that could happen to you is to be invited into the quilting circle because there you would find out everything about your neighbors you needed to know. There was a euphoria that came to being in this circle for the very first time. You learned new words, you learned new skills, and you learned who to watch out for. Uh, my mom, my grandmother was a quilter. Um, I tell you that to tell you about Paul, who uh, made a living quilting tents, building tents, sewing together tents. 
I also think he was somewhat of a quilter in that he gathered up people from all over Europe and made them part of the community of faith, kind of quilted and stitched their lives together so that they became something together that they could not have been any other way. That people love this story that Paul told about Jesus Christ who makes a person's life whole. When he told that story in Galatia, there were hundreds of people who gathered and made it theirs. There wasn't a church building like this for to attend. They did church in individual homes, just like my mama did. And they would have their own circles. So I think there probably was enough food and there was enough prayer and there was enough gossip to make you infatuated with the place. Five years after Paul has moved out of Galatia to do other churches in Europe, he gets word that new preachers have shown up in Galatia and has begun to spread anxiety so that the people who were in that community were uh, getting ready to abandon it and turn it into a synagogue, a Jewish community. Um, The new preachers, these self-actualized, self-appointed czars of the Department of Truth from Jerusalem, had come in to say that the Paul they followed was not authorized, the Jesus they were following isn't the real Jesus, and the gospel they have isn't the real gospel. Almost every human being has some part of their past that was shaped by trauma or the fear of abandonment, and that terror is the birthplace of anxiety. And if you can find where somebody is anxious, if you can touch it, you can control them. All sales is based upon me making you anxious about something you don't have and then selling you the thing that will make the anxiety go away that you didn't know you had until I told you. That is the self-actualized preachers that have infiltrated Galatia. And Paul's going, what's happened to you? That's not how you started. How are you so easily distracted? Uh, Ten years ago, there were six people who were part of a company having a business convention in Colorado. They had flown there, attended the business sessions at the Eldor Mountain Resort during the day, and then would go skiing at night. Four of the skiers, four of the business people were exceptionally good at skiing. They had been doing it for years and vacationed there. Two were relative novices who didn't know how to ski well, had been on them before. I've only been on skis once. Um, And I must tell you that the idea of taking a slim piece of wood and putting it on your feet so that you can't walk, and then putting wax on the thin piece of wood so that it slides, then putting you on ice at the top of the mountain, sounds like something a terrorist does, not like it's recreation. So my experience of it was terror. For these six that went, they were into the adventure. Four of them uh, would acquiesce and kind of do the easy skiing to be with the two who were learning. And the two who were learning would do that kind of like the bunny run first, and it was kind of fun, and they began to feel really good. And then they went on a kind of beginner slope and then an intermediate slope. At the beginning, at the end of the intermediate slope, everybody was having fun, but the two, newbie, the two people that fell down, that crashed numerous times, By the end of the fourth day, they were great on the intermediate slope. They were convinced that they were the next Olympic athletes who would win gold for America, that they had become perfect. They had so much fun skiing, they decided to extend the trip beyond the business experience of a week and stay for the weekend. On Saturday, they were going to try a more challenging run. And on Sunday, if they were up to it, the double black diamond don't tell your spouse what you're doing run is where they were headed. Saturday went incredibly well, so even the novices felt the confidence that they could take the most challenging run and master it. As they are on the Cascade lift, taking them to the West Elm Crest, they were ready to do the run. On the way up, there was a sign that told them the run on the other side of the mountain was closed for fear of avalanche. When they got out of the lift, every one of them, one, two, three, four, was headed towards the double diamond run. And the two novices, one of them went to the double diamond run. The other one, believing he was going to be the next Olympic athlete, ignored the sign on the way up, ignored the sign that said that the run was closed, 
and went to the top of the mountain where they feared an avalanche. The snow began to move. Hundreds of tons, 50 miles an hour, picked him up and threw him against rock and tree. When the rescue team found him, he was dead. They revived him and by helicopter took him to a Colorado hospital. There he was unconscious with the bottom of his legs and the top of his legs broken, his ribs crushed. He had a skull fracture. The five of them gathered around his bedside, canceled their plane flights to head home and held a vigil, hoping that he would regain consciousness. Four days later, he woke up and there was jubilation in the room to have him back. Jubilation by everyone except the novice, the other novice named Jim. Everybody went home. The next morning, the next morning before anybody else got there, before the doctors had made their rounds, Jim went to visit his friend. And he said, are you awake? I'm awake. And then he hit him in the chest with all of his might. Why did you pretend you didn't know you could fail? Anybody who's ever had any addiction with food or alcohol or gambling knows that it only works if you pretend this time is going to be different. This time it's going to be fine. This time the outcome's be going to be what I always dreamed of. This time I won't end up tied up in knots and my life filled with anxiety. This time, what do you pretend you don't know? Paul reminds the people in Galatia that their lives have been tied up in knots. Do you know what I mean by tied up in knots? When I joined my grandmother for the sewing things, um, I, my only job was to put away what was left over from what they had done. That included gathering up the thread and putting it around the spool of thread that it came on. You know what I mean? But you can do it really fast if you just gather up the thread and throw it in the bag and no one knows. The problem is, the problem is, before electronic devices and their wires had learned how to mate in the dark, do you know what I mean? Thread had invented that process. So that if you just throw the thread back into the bag, when anybody wanting to sew gets the thread out of the bag, it will be in such knots that you can't untie it. The thread's just useless. Paul reminds the people in Galatia that they had a religious practice that was about doing the right thing at the right time, always and everywhere. About being perfect, and if they were perfect, then life would be perfect. If they acted the right way, life would act the right way. If they were perfect with God, God would be perfect with them. And they had tied themselves up in knots. This following the four elemental laws, earth and wind and fire and air. <sighs> And he says, what you're doing now by taking on the law is you're just taking up another thing to tie you up in knots. Paul then opens his life for them to see. That's what I did. I thought I was doing what God wanted, and I was just trying to be perfect. And perfection, this aim to be right so that God will be right, gives you anxiety and frustration and anger and murder. Because Paul had become a terrorist, blind to what God was doing in the world. He thought he was serving God by this anxiety that was fueled by him thinking that the worst was yet to come unless he did everything right. Do you know what I mean? So he writes to them, why would you give up the peace and the freedom you have in Jesus Christ to go trying to be perfect, to make happy somebody that's not a God at all? Why are you throwing your faith away, your freedom away? Why are you throwing Christ away? Why are you throwing me away? When you first met me, my eyes were so gross that some people had nothing to do with me. But you embraced me. You said that you would give your very eyes to let me see. Why are you throwing me away? Don't you know that you are the children who received a promise from God made to Abraham? that you would be blessed, children of God. It isn't something you have to earn or something you have to accomplish. There's no perfectionism you have to achieve. You are the children of God now. You are the brothers and sisters of Christ now. The kingdom of God is yours now. You don't have to wait to get in. You're in. 
Why are you letting somebody snip the thread that holds you together apart? This week, I did a funeral for a member of our congregation. When I say for her, her name is Flip and she's alive, but her 42-year-old son died from choking on a chicken bone awful kind of death in which there's so much more you wanted your life to be and you had hoped you would get it. But death is so final. I sat down with Flip and we talked about the service she wanted me to perform, what she wanted to have happen. And I said, tell me about his friends and who's going to be coming. And what she told me I had kind of figured out. He was a pipe fitter, grew up mostly blue collar, rode a motorcycle and hadn't been back to church since he was about eight years old. He had found another community and another life. When the service started and I watched the people pour in, there was one person, Judy Drakowski, besides Flip, I knew in the audience. Everybody else had not learned about the dress that some people wear when they go to church. They didn't know what they were going to find when they come in. They didn't know where they were supposed to sit. They didn't know quite what a bulletin was supposed to accomplish. And so what I wanted to do was somehow say to this audience, I wanted to say to them that they're in the right place, that this is where they belong, this is where they fit. I wanted to find a way to weave their lives into the life of Jesus Christ. That's the challenge, don't you think? That Christ has given his life for us. It's not that we have to come to him, but he has come looking for us. And so I used that image Um, And so I thought I'd share with you a little bit of what I told them. What I told them was, can you remember the first time you met Jesse? Do you remember the conversation and what you did? Do you remember the last time you were with him? I know when his mom, Flip, met him for the first time, it was an emergency C-section in which after the birth, he had to be resuscitated because he had died. Uh, He had to be resuscitated in his life two more times, and it was from self-inflicted wounds. And maybe some of you were there. And now your life is woven with his so that of all the places you could be today, you've chosen to be at this funeral. And now your life is interwoven with mine because Jesse somehow made us together. I want you to know that I've never met Jesse. And all I know about him, I have heard through the words and the heart of a loving mother. My guess is you know stories about Jesse Flip has never heard. And they all nodded in agreement. Kind of an agreement that let me know they were never going to tell me either. (laughs) That they were going to keep faith with that kind of past that they had. And I said, out of all the things you knew about him, did you know that when he was four or five years old and his parents took him to church, when he was four or five years old, he was in his bedroom. And in his bedroom, he loved to play with Legos. And he had made a five-foot-tall cross out of Legos, blues and greens and yellows and oranges. And it was laid down on the ground. And when his mom came in to check on him, the four-year-old Jesse was lying on the cross. And his mother said, Flip said, Jesse, what are you doing? And he said, I was just wondering what it's like to be Jesus. Uh, If that life kind of gets woven into you and changes how you see the world, the filter you use to understand what's going on, uh, at the end of his life, he had signed an organ donor card so that Flip had comfort by knowing that there were some parts of our region in which people could now see because they were seeing with his eyes. People were breathing with his lungs. The heart pulsating in one person's chest was Jesse's heart. Tissue harvested from his body was making other people alive. That somehow he was alive. His body was given to live inside of others. So when you and I take communion, When you and I take communion, we're not simply remembering somebody who died for us, but somebody whose life is in us, whose body is in us, that you and I see the world through Jesus' eyes, that you and I have in us the breath of Jesus Christ, so that when Jesus prayed, he prayed in the name of the Father. He prayed to the Father, whom he called Abba, Papa, So that when you and I pray, we pray to the same Father, call him Abba, call him Papa. That we are not waiting to one day become the children of God, but we are already the children of God. We have already been stitched into the quilt of the people of God, and there is no one who can, with scissors, cut us out. 
You don't have to wait for the kingdom of God to come. It has already come to you. It is already in you. You are the people of God. What do you think? What Paul didn't want the Corinthians to do, I mean, the Galatians to do, was to forget what they knew was true. To not give in to the anxiety of not being good enough. But to know that you are the heirs of a promise in which God has promised you the kingdom. I offer it to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.